Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Junior Doan. Welcome to Junior Doan's The Spark. I'm really excited today because I'm at the studio of renowned artist Michelle Oka Doner, a good friend of mine, and I've asked her to illustrate for us the creative process when she creates her art. So join me over here as I walk over to see Michelle, who is Thank coming you know. into her studio. Please take a look at her studio as we go towards what, Michelle? Pots of hot wax, which actually it's good they sat for a while because they're not steaming. And they are being poured into what kind of a frame? This is a rubber mat, so it provides resist. And it was made to the depth of uh, bronzes that are cast to go into terrazzo, which is about quarter of an inch and I have them custom made. I've gone through many for Miami Airport and many other projects. This particular project I'm working on today is going to the Eli Broad Graduate Business School at uh, Michigan State University which was his alma mater and they knew because of the wonderful Broad Museum in LA that Eli had a gene for the visuals, so yeah. they incorporated a work of art into the building and got in touch with me. They had seen work I did in Ann Arbor and wanted something a little different. So um, I'm using a theme that comes from the uh, Red Cedar River that goes right through the campus, and the Graduate Business School happens to back up into the area where the river, the watershed it's called. It's really quite wonderful. So I researched all the fish that are you, in the Michelle. river. And then you can see here I've got the carp and pike and lots of fish. And then I get down to the structure, the patterns, and then the cellular structure. And so it's really quite interesting. And then I abstract it because if you put just a fish, you'd say, oh, that's a carp, or that's a fish, and then you're done. But if you put a pattern, it's mysterious and magical. You're never quite sure what it is. It could be this, it could be that. It could be connected to something other than the fish, like all of life. <laughs> Would you so. keep the the outside and play with the inside or you play with even the margins? Everything. There's going to be about 200 pieces. So... Of different... Of different variations on a theme. In a strange way, uh, it's like classical music. It's a tone poem. Yes. And it moves through the big atrium and there's stairs looking down so you need some large pieces, you need scale. You need depth of field, like you look at the stars at night and it's not polka dots. There's tiny ones, there's a little bit larger ones, and you have a sense of the infinity, you have a sense of space. Where is this going? Is this a floor, a ceiling? This a will be embedded way? in the floor. In the floor. So it's part of the building, which I love because yes. If you went to Europe in the 50s, uh, before we began our own program in this country of the NEA, National Endowment for the Arts, and Percentage for Art, all those buildings instinctively had works of art built into them. And Lewis Mumford in his great Bible, The City and History, said that from the beginning when people came together to trade and to um, uh, exchange, you know, people from the water had coral, people from the mountains had iron. They would usually meet by a river. Yes. He said they didn't just swap and go home. They exchanged songs. 
what were early poetry, maybe a little theater, and maybe a few other things. And he said that the arts are part of human connection and gathering since the beginning of time. And then he traces it in this book. And I felt so happy when I read it and yeah. so connected because the buildings I love the most, the works of art, are like San Marco Cathedral in Venice where the floor is Cipollino marble, the green and white to make sure we remembered the waves under us. And uh, all of the um, wonderful Gothic cathedral, the Romanesque, Oriental rugs where you don't build but they were meant to do the same. Uh, have the same notion of bringing life into the dwelling. So that's what we're doing here. In this building, is this a, um, a, a walkway entrance? Did you, how did you, what do you ask yourself when you have a commission like this, when you have volume space? Or well, usually, or yeah. arrival? Um, they usually ask, they usually present a space to an artist. Right. But in this case, I think it was fairly down the road before they realized, yes, they could raise the money for the building, for the art, and then they were off and running. So at that point, they had a designated space. And so I accepted it because I'd love to have a piece at Michigan State. Right. Um, my friend Zaha Hadid, yes. she had the building. I was there for the opening. Yes, I felt I very connected to, yes. and then I was, I know Eli Brode not well, but I lived in Detroit, so I had a, a sense of community, extended community, even though I'm a Wolverine, not a Spartan. Yes, so. Michigan comment. <laughs> uh, so what would you like people to experience when they're mm -hmm. in the space you have created for them to stand on? People should be transported by works of art. They, they should feel transformative, another trans word. Um, the I, Art isn't something that hangs on a wall and you absorb with a glance. In, it's not a pass-by experience. Mm -hmm. It should envelop you. It always did, even in Japan. That's why they built the wooden homes so beautifully. Yeah. Then even the cup you lifted to your mouth there. In Scandinavia, the same. The wood was crafted, the seat was made, especially the spoon. Life was, art was life. And the Japanese don't even have the word art in their vocabulary, in the same way the Eskimos have 10 words for snow. Yes, so right. art in this country has been relegated to a sm smaller place. We're a newer country. And the gallery seemed to dominate, so that was the marketplace, so you could acquire it. But how about living in it? So what I'm hoping is the students, the faculty, the visitors to the school feel the sense of place, that the flow of the river has moved into the building, the sense of life in that river that they can't see, but I'm presenting, so to speak, to them on life's silver platter, holding it up. And also, you're saying we are but a moment in time, right? Which is so true, and you know. And that out of that, you know, you're here to study, business in particular, but remember, we're a moment in time, and that you should make it more beautiful, or spiritual, or meaningful. It's and just, connection yes, to the natural recognize world. connection. The notion of other. connection to the natural world is um, becoming an intelligence recommended by Howard Gardner at Harvard yes. to add to the other intelligences because he understands that without that connection we are not going to um, retain enough of the natural world to support human life. So it's not an idealization, it's a necessity that children understand when they throw something out where it's going or you know, the whole cycle of life really is very important. He took just reading and math, which is what I grew up with, right. and expanded it to seven intelligences. Yes. And now the connection to nature is his eighth. And it's not quite um, in the canon, but he's been uh, working on it. So are you really saying that when you're asked to do a commission and you accept it or and then mm -hmm. you start with 
what's around in the, in the natural world that could give me either inspiration or reference? Sometimes. Now, with National Airport, that, that was a commission for Caesar Pelly. Right. And um, I based it on the notion of flight. So it was more conceptual. Yes. So what flies? I had a bat. I had a bee, I had a bird, I had a plane, I had Icarus. Yes. I had an angel because human, humans in their minds fly. Right. But yes. then again, that makes it magic. It makes it a puzzle. And I like that. I like to play. I, I am not so literal. So you're speaking fact, to I'm the, uh, a, yes, let's I'm watch. getting a, yes, a stick so I can draw and then I'll get a knife so I could cut with wax. Everything's got wax on it. I have wax on it. <laughs> Sometimes I leave here and I try to get the wax out of my fingers. Okay, Michelle. So, I mean, so this... Do you need this? No. I was just going to ask my assistant what we needed that for, but I'm going to do is plug this back in. So now that I'm here watching, add some more wax. I just read that if you hit the target every time, it's too close. <laughs> it's not fanciful, not big enough. Yeah, so it, sometimes we just... I think the, actually the mistakes are the discovery sometimes. I think so, They become too. the teacher. That is so true. So there's always a pot poured and a pot going. So this, and they have to be watched. So I usually look at one of these and get a point of departure. So here was the, the drawing I submitted. It gives you a sense of um, the proposal. And I'm gonna take these off. You can see what the scales look like. And the abstraction of the scale coming from the real scale. Which is the real scale? This would be a real scale. You see how it would look. And I ha actually have two of them. So I see the flow the maintains. Yes. Uh, the rhythm. Flow? Rhythm? Yeah, there's a rhythm yes. and a flow. But this is very, this has been intriguing me. You asked about the shape here, but also how to cut all these pieces. So the answer is I don't know, but I'll give it a try. And then I always have a second shot with it because I can um, eat away at my cuts with the heat gun. Oh, so interesting. So it is interesting. So nothing is so final. And I tend to like, and here's a fish. It's a real, you see how we've abstracted it so... Made it better. Yeah, well, you can... <laughs> Different, anyway. It's clear. It's, it's clear. So with that, I have to wait for this to set up so I can then work it. Otherwise, um, it's goo. Which would you like in front of you? I'm just already... I see it. I just want to get the shape. But what I'm going to do is go up and back down so that I have a nice kind of a double... Oh, so these are really drawings. I see that. And that's what makes them so alive, too. So what I am seeing is from the edges in. Yes. From the outline to the yeah, big to line the, to, to the, the side. Yes, and I've taken a lot of liberty. I'm cutting it off after there. And then I'm going to do this. I'm going to, once I start, I, I, I don't need it usually too much more than drawing. This is quite detailed, though. Very detailed. About how many minutes do you have between the right <laughs> way to start the drawing uh, and when you lose the option because it sets up too hard? The morning is, you have m more time because the mat is cold. By the afternoon, it's really difficult because the mat is warm. 
Oh, you have more time, actually. And well, the mat's cold, so you have more time. Let me, let me, let me rephrase that. In the afternoon when the mat's warm from being used, this rubber mat, so they, they take a long time to set up. But in the morning, it's very quick. I don't mind that. I'm quicker in the morning, too. <laughs> <laughs> do you find there's some part of the day you'd prefer to do this? Morning. Yeah. It's Absolutely. probably quieter, too, energetically. Yes, I used to not be a morning person, but I am now. Now, I know it's well practiced at this point, but does it have to be at a certain depth? Yes, it has to be so the terrazzo can go, th go through. You have to have really clean openings. Otherwise, the terrazzo will pop out and somebody's stiletto will go into the... Um, that's not good. That's no, not good at all. That's exactly for the correct. For the person. Right. It's not good for a lawsuit. That's exactly correct. So you're starting to cut. Starting to cut. And then... And this is about a quarter of an inch deep to the, yes. to the frame? So here, you're going to need some, what is it, uh, structure to hold it all together. And so you have to cut knowing that you need a frame for every cut. Otherwise, it'll just flop around and fall off. You know, it has, so that is the interesting part too. And from your experience at this point, how wide does the frame have to be to be secure? It has to be Minimum. wide enough so that it can be cast also. You know, it has to go through a casting process. So that is another issue all together. If something's too thin, it won't cast. It'll just get lost in the burnout. You know, you need, you need the bronze Heft. to yeah, pour through. You need the ceramic shell that's holding the bronze to also. Let's see now. See, so you have to reference, is it? Yep, they do. They get larger on the bottom. That's what I needed to see. That makes sense, doesn't it? It makes sense, but it's it, um, it's. I mean, I find it artistically very interesting because the whole shape refers upward, but if you look within, the whole direction is towards downwards to the bigger scaling. Yes, because it's going down to the fish. Yes, but you're, we're not. We're looking at the that. tail here. Yeah. All right. So what's interesting is we have all these free forms of, you know, representing here, just flew out. Um, so you asked what the buckets were. You see now that all the stuff that comes out of here, the scrap, everything, is, uh, puts, goes back and gets melted down again. Everything gets used. I really like that. Um, I like it for many reasons because it keeps the creative um, attention. <laughs> it's very focused work. Um, I in made, fact, I'm impressed yes. that you can, uh, so to speak, uh, concentrate doing that and concentrate talking to me uh, while you do that. Um, I don't do, it all, do that all the time. In fact, I rarely do it, but just the other day I was working on a limited edition book which I wish I had here to show you. Uh, the Intuitive Alphabet has a limited edition, and I have to write on every cover. And uh, I was distracted by somebody asking me a question, and I lost my pacing. I didn't misspell anything. Yeah. So then I decided, all right, uh, I'll just take the brush, the same brush, dip it in water, and see what I get. So it got to be a blurry painting. And people came in and said, oh, I like that. They didn't, I said, it's a mistake. And they said they didn't see it. So I pointed <laughs> it out. And then after it lived here for about two months, I realized that I was the only one at this point who understood it was a mistake. 
and to get over it. <laughs> but yeah. that's what happens when you're distracted. I, Sometimes that what I make is a, innovation. Yeah. Um, doesn't meet one standard, and but it allows for other um, creations. Mm. I was thinking technically, actually, but uh, certainly artistically. So, so, Michelle, what happens once you complete this? Does it have to harden to a certain point? How do you get it out of the frame? It hardens so it holds its shape. Yes. And then I lift it out. I peel it up. It'll peel. And so that I didn't... Like a modern TV. Like, yeah, like this now, I'm not going to have a chance to do anything with. So sometimes I'm tempted just to do a shape, but today I will just leave it. I'll just try to get this much done quickly. How's that? Sounds right. And when you lay out uh, in your mind a floor of this size. What mm -hmm. is the size going to be roughly? You know, I don't remember the square footage, but I bet it's uh, about um, over 3,000 square feet. Um, so when you decide the size of mm -hmm. the fish scaling, are you thinking of seeing it from far away, from just standing over? Does that play out in your decision on size? Or does the frame determine all? Well, the couple things. First of all, it's an atrium that has oh, volume. Um, and the, they have two or three floors looking down on it yes. as you go up in the building. So it's going to be seen from many Distance vantage points. As well as on top, yes. But then this has a limitation yes. of two feet, two and a half feet. And then also the. Um, the foundry has a limitation of about three, three feet, and at some point it gets too big, they have to cast it in two parts and weld it. And I don't think those welds hold. ever, they hold, but there's always a line that comes from moisture. Oh, yeah. I see it, and I, so I'm not trusting of the welds. Interesting. See, now I'm just purely making it up. I mean, I, you know, I'm just amusing myself with shapes here that go down. How do you find the creative process as a certain element of not only surprise, but fun? Oh, sure. Um, if I'm not enjoying it, how can I expect other people to? Yes. You know? And um, I think it's true in art, but I think there's a lot of applications of creativity, which is a form of um, inspiration, decoration, ingenuity, problem solving. Sure. Um, yes, it's not just product oriented. That's, unfortunately, I think it's our Protestant ethic here that ornament was crime, you know, ornament, you know, the, the Puritans, the... Yes. The, these notions of excess have, are so embedded in, in America that I'm wondering sometimes if the, if the uh, um, way we go overboard is a, is a reaction to that endowment, that early endowment of no fuss, because the Europeans certainly didn't have that. Hmm. Certainly not the French. And they, they are brilliant at luxury, and the Italians are brilliant at building in the creative life to the everyday. Well, let's see what's happening here. I'm thinking about um, what you said, and I'm also thinking about the floor. Have you learned anything about spatial relationships about how close you'd like to put some of these figurines, of uh, uh, figures, or um, how does one know when enough is enough? I think certain patterns just keep emerging over the years, and then I noticed 
I noticed that. I, it was the feedback loop, you know, the famous feedback loop. So over, over a lifetime of 30 years of doing this, I've come to see certain things work, especially the notion of the depth of field, as I said earlier. And other ideas come into play. And when you mention spatial relations, relationships, that's another Howard Gardner triumph, is he had that named as one of the intelligences, as a matter of fact. Um, one of the things I really love about you, but I love about your work, is uh, the sense of universal and the sense of spirituality and sort of, uh, what do I want to say, um, a sense of both wisdom and celebration. And uh, to have that visceral reaction uh, to something really is a gift to me and I'm sure other people who, who see your work and other artists' work for that matter. It's nice to have a moment of reverence and I think that uh, for me, at least, and hopefully a whole many, uh, a whole, <laughs> a whole amount of uh, legions of people see that and have whether it's a book, jewelry, um, sculpture you did of me, all of it is um, it speaks to a truth that's hard to in poetry. It's hard to find words um, for. So. Uh, I thank everybody for being with us while Michelle continues her, her work in wax. And uh, Michelle, when is this going to be installed? I think in the summer. So by 2019, we invite you to Michigan State to walk on it. In the meantime, you may check her, her website. In two weeks, it will be new, and I hope something of this will be on it. And I thank her for doing this because we are all creative. Remember, find the spark in you. Do something kind for someone you know and you don't know. And also, all life has a creative aspect. Live well at that dimension and you will find um, a greater sense of satisfaction and happiness. And that applies to your relationships with people. So please go out and have a week full of positive sparks and I'll see you the very next time. Thanks so much for tuning in and thank you, Michelle. Very nice, Junia. To contact Junia, send her an email at juniadonesthespark at gmail.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadonethespark.com. Dot com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on Junia Dones the Spark. Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.